Um, there's been a lot of uh, contentious discussion over the Oxford-Cambridge arc. Uh, there was a plan for a railway, a plan for a road. The road has been ditched. Has the whole concept of the arc been ditched? Well, as far as we can see, it's really been put on the back burner. Um, there was a big consultation that finished in October of last year. Since then, it seems to have been deprioritised by the government. And I think that's leaving everyone involved in this project thinking, does the government care about this anymore? It's a real challenge. Now, lots of people say that this particular project could be the big driver for growth. It could be the big key policy that actually generates a, a better quality of living for everyone in the country. Why does this particular area have such a potential to grow the economy? Well, one thing we know, if we look around the world, if we look at Silicon Valley, if we look at Boston in the US, if we look at uh, Israel, is that if you've got lots of smart people doing great research, if you make it easy to build houses and offices near those people, the magic of the free market will do its thing, people will set up businesses, and economic growth will happen. Now, this is fantastic, so long as you allow people to build. And one of the tragedies of the UK is we channel lots and lots of public funding into two very beautiful towns, Oxford and Cambridge, surrounded by tight green belts where it is almost impossible to build anything. Now, the Ark is an attempt, it's a sort of second best attempt to say, how do you solve that by allowing people to build some things in between Oxford and Cambridge, Milton Keynes, Bedford, link it up, as you say, with roads and rail, so that it gets easier for entrepreneurs to, to, to set up the things they want to. That's why it's so important. So it's a second best approach. Instead of making Oxford and Cambridge mega cities, it's about sort of having dots of places to live in between and pretty good transport. Um, I suppose the issue here with the United Kingdom's planning system as it is, is people can object to things being built near them. Not on their land, but near them. And lots of people who live between Oxford and Cambridge have been voicing their opposition to this uh, project, and, and potentially this is why the government has got cold feet. That's exactly right. I mean, this is a challenging thing politically. If you're an MP for a constituency, if you're a local councillor in that arc, from your point of view, you might be much happier if everyone just forgets this. That's obviously great for people who live in the individual places to avoid disruption. But if what we care about is the economic future of the UK, stopping stagnation, raising wages, then something needs to be done. Now, another criticism that may be levelled against the ARC is that this is a very southern thing. You can't get much more southern than Oxford and Cambridge in an arc that orbits London. In the, in the context of levelling up, where the government wants to generate growth and opportunities for the whole of the United Kingdom, not just the South East, how does the arc fit into that? I think there's two ways it works. The first is it makes it easier to move at the moment. It's very difficult to move to Cambridge unless you're on an incredibly high salary because it's so expensive. If you can build more or let, allow people to build more, it makes the benefits of Cambridge, which we all fund, taxpayers across the UK fund a research there, it makes that more accessible. That's, that's, that's one option. I mean, the other question is if you really say, well, you don't want this stuff to happen in Oxford and Cambridge, then you have to think differently about where you fund university, university research. But it seems to me that that's off the table. So if that is off the table, then we need to think about how we can build more in and around these two places. How does economic growth in Oxford and in Cambridge and in the arc between them, how does that help the rest of the country? So a few things. Firstly, it generates more tax revenue, can provide more investment in public services and so forth. It provides jobs that other people can come and do. And these businesses have supply chains. They create opportunities for suppliers around the country. We know that a lot of these benefits stay in country. So holding back the most potentially productive parts of your country are going to do a disservice not just to those parts, but to everyone. Uh, so if we're looking at this potential rail project, which has not yet been cancelled, despite the uh, vociferal opposition uh, of those who live between those two cities, uh, what's the progress here? When, it, when are the next points of contention? What are we going to see in reality happen with this project in the near future? I think we're all waiting for the next announcements from the Department for Levelling Up, who are, 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 are very important in this. Um, I don't know when those are going to come, but I think we re the, the next two months could be crucial for this. It will be really valuable to hear in the PM's coming plan for growth a real commitment to saying we're not going to drop this, we're going to do something here. Now, there are lots of things that the United Kingdom government could do to spur growth. It's clear that an easy and probably low-cost version is the Oxford-Cambridge arc, but what are the other areas that the United Kingdom government should be looking at to try and get up our sclerotic growth 
due to be the second lowest in the G20 next year? So one thing that is very achievable in you know, the next 18 months is something very politically possible for the government to do that literally focuses on the same Oxford and Cambridge question is you could simply grant planning permission for a square mile outside Cambridge and build a new city. That would be entirely possible. It's entirely within the government's planning. It's not going to be politically popular in Cambridge, but it's going to create huge benefits to the wider economy. And I suppose it's Cambridge totally is an area trending against the government anyway, but potentially they're not going to win an area within that square. You, a square mile is quite a small place for a city. Is that fit, enough? You can fit a lot of houses into that kind of area. You can build... Um, those of you who've got a historical mindset will think of Edinburgh Newtown, built mm. in the 18th century. It's kind of beautiful Georgian design. Mm. You could build Cambridge Newtown in some of the, the fields outside Cambridge, are pretty kind of nondescript agricultural fields. You wouldn't be losing a lot of natural it's beauty. It's not green, it's ploughed. It's, it's, and you could, I mean, that would... Cambridge at the moment is a city of about uh, 125,000 people. Mm. Cambridge could be a city of a million people and could power UK economic growth into the next decade huge opportunity if the government wants to grasp it. Wow, well, what a, what a profound offer. Let's hope that someone from the Department for Leveling Up has been listening and, <laughs> and that they may take this up. Well, Stian Westlake, thank you so much for joining us on the briefing this morning. It's been a really fascinating discussion.